Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping um, program. It's been a little bit since we've had an online uh, program, so I welcome everybody. Today, we're going to talk about something fun and exciting, Master Gardener Secrets Revealed. Okay, so let's move on with that. I'm trying to watch people come in at the same time. So I am Lily Browning. I am the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator here for Fernando County Utilities for the Water Department. Here are the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping. Um, and every master gardener in Florida is taught these nine principles, I know, because I am asked to come in and teach them, but also uh, their, their program is kind of built on these nine principles. Every um, horticulture program that UF offers is built on these nine principles. So here they are, and we're going to cover uh, probably almost every one of them today as we go through the program. First of all, well, as we're going coming along, first of all, let's cover one thing. What exactly is a master gardener volunteer? Um, and that is the uh, new verbiage that the University of Florida wants us to remember to use. And not just an MG for master gardener, but an MGV volunteer, because that's an important part of who they are. Um, they're volunteering uh, to learn all this information and they're volunteering to share it with the community. So what exactly, how do you get a title as master gardener? How does a person come upon that title? It is not a self-given title, it's actually a copyrighted title. Um, so what happens? And um, more than just Florida has these. Uh, it started in Washington state, I'd say in 19, um, I am thinking, 78, but it may, it's sometime in the 70s. And what happened is the, um, every state has what they call the land grant university, where your college of agriculture is. In Florida, that is the University of Florida in Gainesville. Um, uh, it's the University of Georgia, it's Cornell in New York, it's Penn State in Pennsylvania, it's UM in Michigan. You know, whatever state you're from, you probably know which is your land grant university. And then um, what happens there is, this is a long history, but in 1914, there was an act of Congress, Smith-Lever Act, which um, dedicated these colleges of agriculture uh, as land grant universities. It all started with the boll weevil in Texas. So, you know, people, farmers became um, a little bit more um, uh, productive. They became a little, had a little bit of money. So they wanted to send their kids to college and to learn more about farming and the science behind it. So with the boll weevil, the scientists at the university, you know, figured out how to defeat the boll weevil with the cotton, but they needed that information to get to um, the public. So they created what they called extension offices in the counties, which are an extension of the university. So you see where, where I'm going here. So that that information can be brought by an agent of that university to the public. And that's how it all began. And then they added um, the, uh, what they called home economics at the time, um, family and consumer sciences, uh, to be with, you know, the wives to help them be more productive in their homes. Then they said, let's involve the kids. The birth of 4-H. See, I'm helping you with this, with this history here. So then, you know, as time goes by, people become more interested in their actual, uh, landscapes and, and ornamental gardens. So they brought in horticulture agents. Let's move up to the mid seventies. These horticulture agents needed help out in the community and they started um, training volunteers. 
that's where Master Gardeners came from. They've been in Hernando County since 1987, I believe. Um, and there's been many come and go um, from that time frame. So they are taught by that horticulture agent who is an agent of the university um, at a college level, scientific research-based information about gardening and landscapes. And um, as a master gardener volunteer, there it's, you know, it differs from state to state, but each of them are required to put in a certain amount of hours to maintain that status as a volunteer master gardener and um, take a certain amount of CEUs. So now you have the history of <laughs> what a master gardener is. So what do I know about them? Why do I know so much? Well, I started work here in Hernando County in 1999 at our local county extension office as a secretary. So I got to learn a whole lot about what uh, extension does and what master gardeners are. I've been hanging out with master gardeners since 1999, assimilating all of their knowledge and information <laughs> and actually took the training myself in 2005. And, at, and I started attending college courses before that and have finished up with uh, being in college for horticulture. So that is where my knowledge comes from, even though I no longer work at the extension office, I'm very happy to still hang out with master gardeners and um, learn a lot of what they know. But when I worked there as a secretary, Teresa, who does that now, she's more than a secretary, she's a program assistant, but she, can tell you how much you learn just from hanging out with them. And then people come in with questions and you end up helping that volunteer find those people's answers. So that's, that's how I come to have this knowledge about them. And um, this is a gentleman here, one of the Master Gardener volunteers. He's still in the office every Thursday, probably from nine to four with all of his vast information here in Hernando County. His name is Bernie. Um, we actually took the Master Gardener training together. Um, but he and I sat down and we came up with these 12 things, 12 secrets that maybe the public would like to know that Master Gardeners know. So let's, let's start on those. But before we do that, if you're considering becoming Master Gardener and you are intimidated by that title, you think that could never be you, or that you're intimidated by the gardeners themselves. Nah, don't do that. The difference between the novice and the master is that the master has failed more than the novice has tried. Every master gardener, every professional horticulturalist, everyone continues to have plants that are failures. The thing is, it's just something you love to do and you keep trying. Here's secret number one that Bernie wanted you guys to know because he deals with um, people who come in every week. So he's used to the, the same questions. So he wants you to know there's no great grass in Florida. That's the, something you should come in uh, just, you know, accepting, but there are some okay grasses. So as far as turf grass goes here in Florida, in Hernando County, we generally mostly have two choices. Um, St. Augustine, Floritam is a variety of St. Augustine. So Floritam or Bahia grass. Those are usually our two choices. Or over time like me, you can settle for a Bahia weed diverse lawn <laughs> area, which that's fine with me. So what he's trying to say here is there's no native, there are native bunch grasses to Florida and actually St. Augustine started as a native tall grass that would grow along the coastal areas. Dr. Lester and I actually ran into some once um, we were looking for 
some invasive plants, something like that. We were on a mission right along the coast um, in Bayport Park, and we came across the most beautiful St. Augustine grass we'd ever seen. But it was about a foot to 80, 18 inches tall. <laughs> Nobody wants that for their lawns. But what happened was, you know, over time, people took that and it was growing where salt water would get on it um, when the tide was high. But it was also growing in the shade. So they took that grass and they hybridized and hybridized and hybridized to try and create something that will grow like a meadow, like a lawn that can be cut short. And um, same, uh, same thing with Bahia and all the others. Bahia they took from South America, trying to create meadows where Florida does not naturally have meadows. <laughs> so that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a non-native plant that we're trying to grow in large areas. So it can be done and it can be done okay. It's never gonna be done perfect and great. That's the, the Master Gardener secret number one. Trying to let more people in here. Number two, it has to do with fertilization. If you don't fertilize, um, if you don't fertilize, your lawn or your plant, here's their secret. It won't die if you don't fertilize it. <laughs> if you ignored it, probably, unless it is planted too low or is the wrong plant in the wrong place. But the fact that you did not fertilize it did not cause it to die. Your lawn or plant will die if you fertilize it wrong. So, you know, a lot of times doing nothing will get you a better um, outcome than doing something. So, um, because if you do it wrong, there could be, nature knows what it's doing better than we do, is the best way to put that. So, and he wants you to know weed and feed can kill. The University of Florida does not recommend the use of weed and feed products on our Florida lawns because those are two different things that should be done at two different times of the year. So uh, we do have an ordinance about fertilizing and January 1st through March 31st, you are not allowed to uh, fertilize your lawn here in Hernando County. A homeowner is not allowed to fertilize their lawn. If you want to try and catch some of those spring weeds, you're going to have to put down a pre-emergent, um, probably figuring out when spring is, that, that's the difficult part. But let's say beginning of February. That is not only when we are not allowed to fertilize, it's not recommended <laughs> to fertilize until the University of Florida, if you get a hold of a publication, will tell you mid-March. But remember, we are under an ordinance that you can't fertilize here until April 1st. That two weeks is not going to make a big difference in your lawn. Regardless, you should not be treating weeds and fertilizing at the same time. And it can kill. It can kill your lawn. If you apply it too late and that herbicide mixes with high temperatures, really above 85, it can become toxic to your lawn. We have had stories, we've seen it many, many times where people put down weed and feed, usually the husband, puts down weed and feed and then their whole lawn is dead. Happened in a community here to the county extension director, they told him about it, um, told him that uh, the lady's husband put down this weed and feed and their whole lawn was dead in one of our gated communities that wants to look really beautiful. So we're looking at a very big expense there. And what happened was it said it was for St. Augustine grass, but in really little letters on that bag, it said not for Floritam. So you really do uh, have to separate those events out as far as fertilizing, 
and doing any weed treatment in your lawns. When Bernie mentions a fungus here, fertilizing a fungus infected lawn will make it a lot worse. Um, what generally happens, and a lot of people still have in their minds, because Floritam grass traditionally has had a problem with chinch bugs. It was actually developed in 1973 to be chinch bug resistant compared to the other uh, St. Augustine varieties that were out there. It was developed by the University of Florida and Texas A&M. Florida TAM, Flora TAM, get that together now, University of Florida, Texas A&M, Flora TAM. And it probably was for the first few years and that resistance wore off quickly. So when I started being involved with the County Extension Office in 1999, sure, chinch bugs were a big issue. But I would say in the past four or five years, and this is a very sad thing to say, but Bernie and other master gardeners tell me they haven't seen uh, more than one or two chinch bugs in a long lawn sample, and that's, that's not uh, an amount to worry about in many, many years. And the sad part comes in in that they haven't seen any live anything in these lawn samples. So we have over treated to the point where there's not much life left in these lawn samples. So if someone tells you, you have a chinch bug problem, second guess that. What you can do is take a lawn sample if you live here in Hernando County. If not, call your local extension office, find out what their protocol is. Here in Hernando County, you can take a piece of your lawn, half good, half bad, maybe eight by eight, 12 by 12 piece, take it into the county extension office. <clears throat> Bernie or Teresa or Bill or somebody um, will look at it. They are so good now, they'll just pull out a piece with the roots under a microscope and they can recognize a fungus called take all root rot on site, basically, because it is so prevalent. So chances are really, 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 really high that you have this fungus in your St. Augustine Floritan lawn called take all root rot. If it seems to be dying there's, and there's nothing you know you do that fixes it, probably the things you are doing are making it worse because when we see a bad lawn, the first thing we think is water it more. That's like an instinct. What's the next thing we think? Fertilize it. Both of those things are feeding the fungus. So before you do anything, take it in for a free diagnosis from one of those master gardeners. If it is beyond their purview to figure out, they can send it to a lab at um, the university of Florida, which will cost you some money, but not, not a tremendous amount. I'm thinking somewhere in the $40 range, maybe, maybe cheaper than that. So secret number three, if you come from up north, every spring you get out there and you sweeten your soil with lime. I'm showing you a picture here taken in central Florida of a lime rock mine. <laughs> We've got lots of those around here. You may not realize it living here in Hernando County, but you know, especially if you come east, you know, further east away from Spring Hill, anywhere that you're driving around, you are probably circumnavigating one of our rock mines. It's our main industry. So all that to say, we don't need to add lime to the soil. Be really, really surprised if you need to add lime to your soil. You can take a um, soil sample. It's another thing that uh, the extension office can help you with. And um, I'm gonna have their phone number at the end to find out how to do that. But basically your soil sample will go up to the soil lab in um, Gainesville. I think a few counties I believe Citrus County might check your pH for you 
We don't do that here in Hernando. We, we send it right up to Gainesville and get a you know, comprehensive test sent back to you. If, if your pH tells you you need to add lime, send me a copy of that and I will eat a bug online. <laughs> Because I really don't think that's going to happen here in Florida. So don't automatically just add lime to your landscape or your lawn. Number four, your neighbor has no idea what a chinch bug looks like. We just discussed chinch bugs. Uh, turn that down. We just discussed chinch bugs a lot but your neighbor doesn't really know what one looks like. They can't, and nor can your lawn guy stand at his six feet tall um, length and peer down at your lawn and see chinch bugs. Unless he's on his hands and knees and he's showing you those bugs, you do not have chinch bugs. You know who else doesn't know what a chinch bug looks like? Not just your neighbor, but your neighborhood Facebook group. <laughs> Um, they may not also know, you know, the secrets to taking care of a good lawn. There are good Facebook groups out there. There are master gardener Facebook groups. There are university uh, based Facebook groups that will give you good scientific information. But a neighborhood group where you um, tune into to ask where should I get a good haircut? Where is a good restaurant? I'm, I'm in the mood for, you know, Mexican food tonight, you know. Um, when you're, you know, what's the best school to take my kids to? All those general questions, that is great. You know, that helps you connect with your neighbors. But just keep in mind those neighbors, um, are coming up with either their own ideas or old wives tales or you know who knows what some of them might come up with you know really uh research-based ideas but if you're looking for lawn and garden information the best place to go is to your local extension office or you can even google whatever um you're wanting to know about say it's poinsettias in the landscape you can Google that and put UF for University of Florida after that, whatever the subject line is, UF, so that you know you are getting a publication that was research-based and scientific. You can even do pretty well if it is a um, university information from the University of Georgia, University of Louisiana, um, you know, somewhere in Alabama, but just be careful um, that the information does pertain to Florida as well. Here's what chinch bugs look like <laughs> from babies on to adults. Um, this adult would be about an inch, maybe less than an inch tall there. Secret number five, unless you are from Florida, and some of you may be, I know you're out there. I'm married to one, fifth generation Floridian. Notice I said I was married to one, I'm not one, but um, so there are native Floridians, there are multi-generational native Floridians out there. I know a bunch of you, but unless you are from Florida, if it grew in your home state, it probably won't grow here. Some of you may say, well, duh, you know, I know that. But it is amazing the amount of people that move here and still want to have the things they loved um, from up north. Or they moved here to retire thinking, now I have the time to do all this gardening. And they try to garden like they're up north. There are just some things like tulips, like some of the hydrangeas, like peonies, like lilacs pussy willows, daffodils. There are some daffodils that um, were developed for the heat. I've never really tried them. Um, so what I would do is when you go on vacation in the spring or whenever to go back up north, 
get as much of those beautiful things as you can, and then come back here and concentrate on what beautiful things you can grow here. It's only going to be frustrating to try and grow here what is not going to grow in Florida. Usually it is not just the heat, it's the humidity. And um, you know, the, there's no chilling hours. Some of these things need chilling hours, but you can still love these things, but <laughs> learn to love what you can grow here in Florida. Consider it uh, a new challenge. And number secret, and um, secret number six. Speaking of which, and this is just a different way of saying nothing grows in Florida, because we do hear that a lot. So they want you to know that plants will grow. They'll grow in our Florida sand. Look around, when, when you say nothing grows in Florida, do you look outside and are you looking at a desert? Um, no, I don't think so. You are seeing trees, you are seeing greenery, you are seeing plants. When people say nothing grows in Florida, I think what they are really meaning is the things I'm used to growing and the things I want to grow aren't working out for me. And it may not even be that you're trying to grow the things you grew up north. There's another thing that happens. You're ready to understand I can't grow some of the things I grew up north. You're ready to understand that, but you think you can grow tropicals as if you moved to Miami when you moved to Hernando County. We have freezes here. We can get below 20, no problem. So the trick is finding what grows in our zone. We are zone 9A. And things will grow in our sand. Both of these things here are in central Florida. The one on the left, I believe in Pinellas County. The one on the right is um, in Sumter County, in the villages. So you did not necessarily the things you had in mind, but if you realize it when you're frustrated saying nothing will grow, generally you're saying that when you're pulling out weeds. So obviously something is growing. So we just have to learn right plant, right place. And that's what you're here for. That's what master gardeners can help guide you with and um, lots of resources from Florida Friendly Landscaping as well as the University of Florida. This one is critical. Master gardener secret number seven. I hope you stayed through to. <laughs> to learn this one, because if you want a lawn, it's the most critical part of having a lawn here in Florida. Mowing height. Mowing height is critical. It's not something that we are on some kind of campaign that we just want to see higher grass. <laughs> I mean, there's no benefit to us to want to see the higher grass. It is the benefit is to the health of your lawn. If you want a lawn, that is going to thrive and be healthy. The St. Augustine Floritan lawn has to be four inches tall. If your company is cutting it shorter, that's the first place to start to um, get a healthy lawn is to be cutting it higher. No amount of watering or fertilizing is going to fix a lawn that's being cut too short. Bahia grass, same thing, three and a half to four inches. The overall health of your lawn is determined by mowing height. I can't stress that enough. It's good news, isn't it? Because that's so easy to fix. That is so easy to fix. So that is very critical to a healthy lawn. Number eight, speaking of lawn services. If you have one, don't hesitate to ask your lawn care service to follow your instructions. A lot of people do. And, you know, it's difficult for these lawn service companies. I understand that they, they're on a time schedule. So they, you know, have to get, it is much easier for them to treat everybody exactly the same and be moving along on their day. They might, have, you know, they have a lot of contracts to get done. But it may be worth it to you to find someone who is going to treat your landscape more as an individual landscape. You know, you work with your doctor the best you can to say, I know my body 
I know what you're trying to say to me, but you know, you are also, you know, trying, <laughs> you know, to treat all humans pretty much the same, but let's work with my body. You need to do the same thing with your landscape. Say, yeah, I understand you've got all this work to do, but I would rather, you know, if you yourself get involved and work with them, you can treat your landscape more personally. Um, I'm sure we all wish, you know, that we had the money like in those um, old TV shows or the British TV shows where everyone seems to have a gardener that, you know, only works there on that property. That would be great if we could afford that. But generally, we're going to get a service that is trying to get a lot of people done at once. But when they come to you, don't let them pressure you. A lot of times we, they, you know, we just like back away when they say, you know, ma'am, I know what I'm doing. You know, I've been doing this business for this, this, and this, and trust me, this is what works. Well, it is your property and you can be free, you know, to learn this stuff and to hire whomever will follow what you want them to follow, including mowing height. Get a ruler out there. See if they're mowing it at four inches that they're applying chemicals at the proper time and you know what they are and why they're putting them there and that they're fertilizing appropriately with slow release. Now companies are allowed to fertilize in that January 1st to March 31st. But if they are mar fertilizing between January 1st and March 15th, ask them why, tell them to stop, <laughs> say, and, you know, find someone else because there's no reason to be fertilizing before March 15th. And just remember, you pay the bill. You are the boss. See this cup here, me boss, you not. <laughs> so it's another thing Master Gardeners want you to remember to be in control of your lawn companies. Here's another secret. Just because it's in the big box store in the nursery, doesn't mean it's appropriate for this area. <clears throat> that can be very shocking to a lot of people. But they do buy for generally southern regions. So a lot of what they have probably is going to work out here. It wouldn't uh, make sense for them to sell a bunch of things that aren't going to um, you know, do well here. But they will get like seasonal things in that they're you know, the, the color, the beauty, whatever is gonna make people impulse buy. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, study what you're buying before you buy it from the big box store. And be careful of those impulse buys. Um, when we talk about this, I have a class on Hernando County Government YouTube called So You're at the Nursery. And that really gets into this of how you should purchase from a nursery. And um, one of the things I say is, you know, we haven't chosen a life partner just on their looks alone. <laughs> There's a lot of other things that are important to us. So we don't want to choose a landscape plant on looks alone to find out if it can grow here. There is a uh, Florida friendly landscaping guide to plant selection and landscape design. You can pick one up at the county extension office here in Hernando County. You can Google it and uh, find it and download a PDF. You can go to the Southwest Florida Water Management District website if you are in one of their counties. I can't remember now how many they have um, here in Southwestern Florida. You can go to uh, resources, for residents and find this book and order it and they will mail it to your house for free. Or you can email me, my email will be at the end and we can arrange for you to stop by here at the utilities office in Hernando County and pick one up as well. If you take a rain barrel class, you usually end up with one. <laughs> um, there are many ways to get a hold of this book and that'll help you learn about the plant before you buy it. And again, plan before you plant. Don't do those impulse buys. Plan before you plant. You know how they say, 
failure to plan is planning to fail. Well, my saying is failure to plan is planting to fail. So just uh, figure out what you're buying and why. Master Gardener secret number 10. If a plant isn't happy, move it. <laughs> you can transplant it, but don't water it more. Fertilize it or prune it to fit that area. This is what the master gardeners want you to know. Great myrtles, that happens to them a lot because people are not knowledgeable about how big they will grow. And also there is this idea out there, it's gonna start happening anytime now, now through February, where people are just gonna hack the great myrtles almost you know, down to nothing. That is not a University of Florida recommended practice. A recommended practice is to let that beautiful form grow. Let, um, it's gonna have a beautiful trunk, has great winter interest, even when it's all naked because it has the beautiful trunk if you don't chop it all up. Um, remove the twiggy intergrowth, remove the suckers from the bottom, remove crossing branches. That's all you need to do. If the crepe myrtle is too big for that area, you know, it was the wrong plant in the wrong place. There are lots and lots of new dwarf varieties, but if it says it's going to be 15 feet, I'd count on 25 or more. Just make the room, make the room for it. You are shortening the life of that crepe myrtle by severely pruning. They call that hat racking. Um, it's not a good, not a good plan for the crepe myrtle. Number 11, this one's so easy. Most problems take care of themselves. You know, we worry so much and um, we do a lot of human intervention, but most of the time problems are gonna take care of themselves, whether you think it's an insect problem. Um, a lot of times we just, we freak out if we see any bug at all on our plant. Maybe it's a good bug who is helping us in the battle against the pest insects. Maybe it's just somebody just stopping there for a rest, you know, just because you see an insect doesn't mean you have to spray. You can scout, make sure things are going okay. You can physically remove that insect um, from that area. You can, uh, if it's one of those big grasshoppers, the lubber grasshoppers, brush it off into some, a bucket of soapy water. But generally, just keep an eye on things and don't react right away because most problems are going to take care of themselves. We're already up to number 12 here. It'll never be perfect. That is uh, something all gardeners need to learn no matter where they are. But it seems, you know, even more, always a struggle here in Florida. So just understand it'll never be perfect and it won't look like your yard in Michigan. And it won't look like your yard in Ohio or Pennsylvania or New York, you know, or New Hampshire, wherever. It's a different kind of grass. Um, there's lots of different differences to it, but we can grow lots and lots of beautiful things here. But just remember, it's always, always a work in progress. Always a work in progress. You're never going to be finished. As a gardener, you're never going to be finished. Um, and there's always something to learn. Every day you can be opening your mind and learning more things and learn by doing, learn by trying, learn by reaching out to the right resources so you're not frustrated and give up. Here in Hernando County, this is how you can get a hold of a master gardener. Um, they are at the county extension office. Here is the address in Hernando County, 16110 Aviation Loop Drive. Um, people sometimes go looking for them in different locations where they've been over the years. 
This is where they are now. Uh, if you know where the post office is on Spring Hill Drive, right where California Street meets Spring Hill Drive, there's the post office. That aviation loop drive is like an access road off of Spring Hill Drive. They're right next door to the post office. Give them a call first. Here's their number, 352-754-4433. Find out um, when a good time to come in to talk to somebody about your issues or bring a grass sample, or even to learn about how, how could I become a master gardener in Hernando County? Um, or you could email Teresa. Teresa's uh, great. She's going to answer the phone most likely. She does everything there. <laughs> she is right now the only clerical um, staff that they have. So she's trying to pay the bills. She's a natural resources program assistant. She's trying to do her own programming. She's trying to help everyone who comes in the door and who emails. But you know what? She handles it all like it's nothing. So she does really, really well. Here's her email, tweglars at ufl.edu. Um, if it's a question that she thinks should go to a master gardener, she'll send it there and you'll hear from a master gardener. If it should go to the horticulture agent, Dr. Lester, she'll send it to him. If she can answer it, <laughs> she'll answer it. But she is also a volunteer master gardener. So um, that's really your best resource. And you can always email me as well. Um, and the thing is we all work together. So if you email me and I don't know the answer, chances are I'm going to be hitting up Bill, I'm gonna be hitting up Bernie uh, or someone from the university um, to find out your answer. Here is my email, Lily B with two L's, L-I-L-L-Y-B at hernandocounty.us. You said any, any questions that you have, if you would like a PDF copy of this PowerPoint, email me, ask me for that. I'll be glad to send that to you so you have this all in writing. And you can keep up with um, <clears throat> what we have discussed here and all the, the nine principles and everything that I teach by following uh, my Facebook page. Also, um, the university, the extension office has a web page, hernandoextension.com, I believe is what it is. You can ask Teresa <laughs> if you call her, and if you don't do Facebook, and you can get on an emailing list to find out all of their classes as well as all of my classes. And um, all of these classes that I do are recorded and you can find them on Hernando County Government YouTube um, in a couple of days. And that is also where they are uh, closed captioned. So if you have someone who would like to watch this, they don't do Facebook and they, you know, would like the closed caption to help them, then that's no problem. Um, that's where you can find that as well. So we have a few minutes. Oh, here are my upcoming classes. Um, said I'm teaching all the time. So next week, Dr. Lester, who is the horticulture agent at County Extension, is gonna help me with climbing the IPM pyramid does that mean? <laughs> well, IPM is Integrated Pest Management. And the Integrated Pest Management period is pyramid is a system to help with um, one of our Florida friendly principles, which is controlling pests responsibly. So this is a scientific system to help you control those pests, and it first starts with ID to figure out whether or not they are pests and how to do that in the most efficient way that uses the least amount or no would be preferable chemicals to do that. So to, um, the event is on my Facebook page. You join it just like you did this one with the link that is provided for that one. That should be a very interesting one. I have uh, rain barrel workshops pretty much every month. Um, the way we've been doing it so far is we do have an in-person one in the mornings. That'll be November 17th at Chinsigat Conservation Center. 
beautiful place to go in November at 10 o'clock in the morning um, out in the woods. So if you would like to join that, email me for um, information. Or the next day you can join a virtual um, class at six in the evening that will not only be rain barrels, this one offers compost bins as well. The rain barrels, well, I put an asterisk there, it was to remind myself to tell you, the rain barrels are $50. So the one, uh, the in-person one is just rain barrels, like it says. The compost bin one, you, if you are a resident of Fernando County, you will get a free compost bin, but you do have to attend the workshop. And then the rain barrel is $50. If you are a customer of Hernando County Utilities, where you get your water, you will get a one-time uh, rebate of $25 on your water bill for attending a rain barrel workshop and taking a rain barrel home. So the same rain barrels that we offer um, that I get in bulk for $50. I found the exact same things at uh, some of the big box stores online for about 148. And so if you're a customer, at least your first barrel is $25. Why I have those asterisks is <laughs> if you've been thinking about getting a rain barrel and putting it off, I wouldn't put it off much past January, February because I am taking bids right now for a new order of rain barrels. You can guess where I'm going with this, can't you? Think about what's going on in the world. Shortages, um, supply chain issues. I'm in the middle of trying to get bids, so I can't you know, discuss any details, but I can tell you that most likely in 2022, you're not going to find a $50 rain barrel even from me. So the cost will be going up. It will still be lower because I'm selling you my bulk price, you know, than you can find in the stores. But so if you've been thinking about it, this might be one of your last chances to get it for 50 bucks. So there's another secret for you. And then at the end of November, right before Thanksgiving, um, Dr. Lester and I will talk about beneficial bugs so that we have some good insect classes coming up for you guys. And just remember, if you don't have to be good at gardening for gardening to be good for you. I found this, this saying somewhere online and I'm just gonna keep saying it. That's gonna be my motto from now on. Even if you're not good at it and you feel like that, that title master kind of intimidates you, Remember the master has failed more times than the novice has tried. And also you don't have to be good at it. If you like it, keep doing it. And um, you're here because you wanna do it in a way that is good for the environment. So whether or not it is gonna make it to a Better Homes and Gardens magazine cover is not the point. The point is, um, are you happy? Is your garden happy? Is the wildlife happy? Are the pollinators happy? That's all we need, you know, that's all we need to strive for. And with that, I'm gonna stop the recording, but if you have any chat questions, um, please feel free to send them to me. Thank you everybody who will be listening into the recording and happy gardening.